Can you just turn up the lights a little bit? Anyone of you back there? Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to everyone that's gathered here, as well as all that are connected via the webcast for this special occasion. We gather this evening for a commemoration of Good Friday. And in the humanly sense, it's hard to understand how anything good could come out of that, since it involves the death of an individual. However, when it comes to the Lord Jesus, his death was no ordinary death. In his death, he sacrificed his innocent life, and it has no equal with anyone that's ever walked the face of this earth. In his sacrifice, he laid the foundation for salvation for all of mankind, and also for the forgiveness of our sins. It provides the forgiveness as well as the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and in his sacrifice, the hope of our resurrection on the day when the Lord Jesus returns. In order to prepare our hearts for this holy celebration, we would like to play instrumentally two verses of hymn number 493 in the hymnal. If you're interested in looking at the words in the hymnal, and the, the name of the hymn is, I gave my life for thee, and we invite the congregation to sing the third time. So we'll play it twice. The third time the congregation is, in, is, is invited to sing, and the words will be posted on the screens. Thank you.
in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, we sing. We sing individually this song, for you are each of our Redeemer, and you are our Redeemer. And it's very personal how we feel. And we are thankful to experience this uncomfortable day called Good Friday, a day in which we must reckon with the great sacrifice, the total sacrifice, the all, all giving sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, that he remained faithful in obedience to what you asked him to do to the very last breath. And because of that, he broke that first act of Satan, which was to cause disobedience. And only your son, as also son of man, this, this in human flesh, was, be, was able to break that. And because of that, we can be forgiven our sins. And because of that, we can receive of the life of his life and the life of his sacrifice so that indeed we can follow in his teaching. And through the activity of the Holy Spirit, you create divine realities for us today, as this evening, as every time when we can gather at the altar. We are there, two or more are gathered, and we can experience a divine reality. And so we focus on the cross, especially in this evening. But we remain focused, because that Good Friday that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice, was the moment of salvation. And so, dear Father, how can we possibly grasp something that is ungraspable? But we want to go deeper. We want to be able to appreciate more and more. We want to be able to practice, as we will hear this evening, the behaviors of our Redeemer that he demonstrated in those last hours and that we can be in a continuation of those behaviors in our time. And so, dear Father, we bring to you our praise, we bring to you our thanks, we bring to you our intercessions, even as the Lord Jesus gave to us that example in interceding and as, as we will receive through your word. And we pray for ourselves, dear Father, as the Lord Jesus also prayed for himself and then he prayed for his disciples and he prayed for all those who would believe on them we pray for ourselves too, dear Father, and we ask, please, help us continue to redeem us. We know that we are not redeemed completely, and so we are thankful that once again, may we take another step in this evening, in this encounter with you. And we remember those who are sick, those who have crossed into eternity's congregation, and many, it feels like have done so recently, but they have touched us in very personal ways as well. Please continue to provide comfort for all who mourn. Let your angels now overshadow us, unite us with our district apostles right down the road, and our chief apostle that in the oneness of the apostolate you can accomplish your purpose in our church upon our souls. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, it is a, a, a reverent joy with, with which I am with you this evening, thankful to experience Good Friday together with you. Love from our Disher Apostle, he is down Route 80 in Clifton. And we have this Bible verse out of Mark 15, the 39th verse. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Please be seated.
the Bible re word for tonight is John 19, verse 16 through 30. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of Jews, but he said, I am the King of Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. My dear brothers and sisters, for me, Good Friday is always uncomfortable because it's painful to think about. It's painful to ponder. Why must it have been this way? Why is it that it was the will of God that his son should give his life on the cross? We don't have the answer to that, but it happened. And we know a little bit more. It's not that God isn't a loving God, because he is a loving God. We know he's a loving God. We believe he's a loving God. And one is sometimes confused and uncomfortable. How could it be that the loving God asked this of his son? Again, we don't have the full comprehension of it. But what we do know is this powerful word that's written in John where it says, and the son of man and the son of God, he died 
perfect, in perfect obedience to the very last breath, even where his father required that you would give your life. He remained obedient to the very last, and by doing that, blew up the effect of the first work of the devil, which was disobedience, and blew it to smithereens. I guess there's no easy way to blow it up. It was drastic, but so was the effect of that first disobedience of which we can read in, in Scripture where Adam and Eve, they were the first ones to, to commit disobedience. And through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that was destroyed. Now, something that just in the sacristy before the service, I have never, I said to the brothers, it never ceases to surprise me how much I have yet to learn. And something just happened in the sacristy where we were looking at the different recordings of the sacrifice of Jesus in Mark and Matthew and Luke. And here, actually, it is in Matthew, it says rather descriptively a number of things that happened. Each gospel refers to a few things that happened, such as the veil in the temple was torn from front to back, and there are a few things that are mentioned in all three. But Matthew, he gets very descriptive. Matthew writes, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Dramatic, powerful. I wonder, now that we understand that this perfect sacrifice of obedience, it just ripped the effect of that first work of the devil, which was disobedience just destroyed it. It is of no more effect for those who will accept, believe, follow, and practice the behaviors of the Lord Jesus, as we will get to in a moment, then it's a whole new beginning. But it says other things. And then it says, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised I'm sure that was not so comfortable, however, that, however they manifested themselves. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, and there was my learning. And after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him, they were still at the cross. They're still at the cross. And so when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And that's the Bible verse that we have from Mark. But a whole number of things happened, perhaps very quickly. And what's so striking to me is that it already refers to his resurrection. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, we don't know the exact timing of Jesus' resurrection. But obviously, he didn't have to wait till Easter. He was already resurrected. Because it says in Scripture that he went to those from the time of Noah. And now, it says, perhaps, he died and he resurrected right away. Good Friday, his perfect, obedient sacrifice on the cross was the moment of salvation. It was the moment of freedom. The lamb, as, as was just played for us, and the resurrection happened before Easter came. Easter was when everybody started to get to see what had happened. But before everybody got to see what had happened, it had happened. 
and it was evident in eternity and, and apparently to Matthew. Otherwise, how could he have written this? And after his resurrection, then these other things started to happen. All the while, the centurion is still at the cross. My dear brothers and sisters, Good Friday just got a lot bigger. It is everything that we know and experience and the uncomfortableness of the journey and Passion Week, and we know that word means suffering. But the moment it was done, it is very probable, according to what we read, that he resurrected. He did not linger in suffering. He had accomplished it. Isn't that wonderful, my dear brothers and sisters? I find that beautiful. It shows our God is a loving God. Our God is a loving God. And obviously our Redeemer is a loving Redeemer. That's why we sing about him. And now, why do we have so many things to sing about of our Redeemer? There's no end to the things we can sing about. As one time, this real apostle called, I don't remember what the occasion was, but I do remember he was serving in Cape Town. And perhaps the service had something to do with uh, this hymn. And then he's made the statement, what's your story? I'll never forget that. <clears throat> what's your story? Oh, that's another hymn, isn't it? I love to tell the story. Wrong hymn. But obviously, we are singing our story. Our story is, in the simplest words possible, Jesus is the plan. Okay, of course, that may be too simple. But for those of us who perhaps have pondered many ways, how would I tell my story? How would I make it short and sweet, as we used to say sometimes, in the elevator? So that if somebody asks you, so you're a Christian, what does that mean? Good Friday, what does that mean? Easter, what does that mean? And you got five floors to tell your story. And it's got to be tight, concise, and meaningful. I, I, I'm sure I'll get the opportunity to try this one day. Someone will give me the opportunity to try it one day. The story is Jesus is the plan of salvation. When we speak of plan of salvation, Jesus is the plan. He was, he was the thought of redemption in the heart of the Father when Adam and Eve committed their first disobedience. And then, of course, he came and, and he showed us now what the path looks like for us human beings so that, indeed, when we believe in him and we follow and we accept and we practice his behaviors, we can seek his grace because we won't be able to do it perfectly. But he says to us, as he said, not with these words, they're not recorded, these words, but in essence, by saying to the malefactor, who said to him, and let me yet be with you when you get into your kingdom. And the Lord Jesus in all confidence said, well, that's going to happen yet today. Today yet you will be with me. He embedded in that was also, I am dying for you. What's happening right now to me, this is for you. And who knows what all the Lord Jesus said that isn't recorded. And if indeed what is recorded are the only things that Jesus said on the cross, that would also be understandable because he was for six hours six hours on the cross. But what all must have been moving in his heart and his thoughts and his prayers. And indeed, if he would have had the strength or if it would have been something that the Lord wanted recorded in Scripture, 
he would have also turned to the other malefactor who didn't believe anything and say, and I'm dying for you too. And he died for me. And he died for each one. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, let us get to the message of the service. The message of the service is that we can, we can learn some very key behaviors that were manifested by the Lord Jesus on the cross. And we can choose these behaviors of Jesus on the cross. These are decisions we can make and decisions that we have to make, and they are decisions we have to make on an ongoing basis. And it was those decisions in, in that span of time where the Lord Jesus was on the cross, and then those things that happened immediately after he breathed his last breath, that then caused this Roman centurion, who we don't believe would have known much about who this is, except it says king of the Jews, but would not have by any reasonable assumption known anything about the Old Testament or the history of the Israelites. And yet this century, in the course of this short span of time, said truly, that was the Son of God. Words that he probably had never even conjured up in his mind, and they came out of his mouth. Truly, this, this was the Son of God. And you may never have thought about what is that son of God. Well, yes, there, that is, was the son of God. So these behaviors are very, very impactful. They even cause someone like the Roman centurion, along with the other things that happen, to be able to have a, an awakening and a revelation. And so when we practice these behaviors, I will get to them. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say sorry for the altar. That's, that's not right. Then uh, souls will be impacted by these behaviors because these behaviors demonstrated by Christ, they, they had an impact. And so... One of these behaviors, here's the first of five. The first was that the Lord Jesus remained calm. That is a whole service unto itself, actually many services unto itself. But the way that it has settled in my heart is that he remained calm because he remained in control of himself. And because he was able to remain in control of himself and how he was reacting to what was happening, he was able to continue to remember that this is what my father has asked and this is his plan and I'm fulfilling his plan and, and then that helps me to remain calm. I don't know how it is about you, but when I am not calm, I forget tons, like how to behave and many other things. When one loses their ability to be in control of their feelings and emotions, it's not pretty, is it? It's not our best moment. But he remained calm because he had been practicing, and he had, this is the other behavior that he demonstrated in, in prayer, in his path to the cross, as we've been hearing all month long, the path with Christ, and the path to the, Christ, to, to the cross, how many times in prayer, and in the Garden of Gethsemane. And even the Lord Jesus had to pray three times for this moment. It did cross my heart and my mind three times. The Lord Jesus had to pray three times for this. Yeah, the Lord Jesus had to pray three times. He had to go back three times. And me? What's my story? Well, Lord, you know how. 
How many times? Really? And the Bible says, keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. Just keep asking. Just keep seeking. That's one of the ways that prayer works. It is, in, it is, it is nudging us constantly to keep coming to the Lord and pouring out our heart, how we feel, the good, bad, and the ugly, and then allowing the Lord to pour into our heart what we need in order to be aware that he's in charge and therefore that I can remain calm even though what's ahead of me would otherwise completely take that away from me. Prayer works so that we can remain in control of ourselves and remain calm. And my dear brothers and sisters, that is needed more than ever before, isn't it? I need it more than ever before, but the time in which we live needs that more than ever before. Because that is not, that is not something that is understood, and so one cannot expect something that one does not understand. But even when one understands it, it's still so difficult if all of us, starting with myself as Christians, would be able to be fully aware of this all of the time and practice it, we would be a lot calmer. And one of those things that perhaps is a vulnerable point for you, I know it's a vulnerable point for me, is when we think this is not heading in the right direction. Uh, this, is, this is a bad ending. And then we get concerned, and then we get fearful, and then, well, I must, must do something to get control of the situation. No, I don't have to do something to get control of the situation. I have to stay in control of myself. It, looks, it doesn't look like anything good is happening, of course, as it, as it was for the cross. <laughs> Everyone thought, well, that, that's really sad. That's awful. What good happened? And yet, it was the moment of salvation. The greater world realized it before the physical world did. It was the moment. In the moment which seemed like a, no, like a, a lost moment. Just remain calm. God's working. And so, his calmness, his prayer, another behavior is that he remained connected to his father. And here is something that the district elder and I too in the sacristy when, when we looked at it, it hit us both the same when, when we had read this for this evening. Where the Lord Jesus, I'm just looking for it here. It's, you know it's in here. Where he said Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Until this Good Friday, I've always interpreted it in a very uh, human way, as if you forgot about me. But it really goes much deeper than that. It is that, because he wanted us as human beings to realize that when we feel like that, that that he knows that feeling. But it goes deeper than that because what that statement is also reflecting is that throughout his life on earth, the Lord Jesus was able to stay very connected with his Father. And at this moment on the cross, at whatever point this was in those six hours, he felt as a soul that was as separated from God's nearness as possible. Perhaps as, as the malefactor on the left felt and the malefactor on the right felt. And in fact, for all souls that would come thereafter, that feeling of, I do not know the nearness of God. I don't know it. And worse yet, I know it, and I know how special that is, and I don't have it right now. My God, my God. Every step of the way, we've been so close. 
And now I know what it feels like not to be close. Oh, can we imagine? Can we imagine that? My God, my God. And so, remain connected. Remain connected. Calm, prayerful, that prayer is working. The things that we can't see, perhaps much more than the things that we can see. And remain connected. <clears throat> and sometimes, perhaps, when we feel that we are not close and near to the Lord, perhaps that happens at times to help us understand what it feels like for souls who don't know what it means to be able to be close to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They don't know it. And if we always feel like we have it, then how could we possibly understand them? How could we possibly understand how they feel? How forsaken that feels? How worthless it feels? And so it reminds us, by the grace of God, I know what it means to be able to be in fellowship with the Lord. And I stay connected. And once again, let us not think that then this is going to stay like that for a long time, even as it was with the Lord Jesus. When, he had, when that moment came, when the event of salvation came, when the recognition comes of whatever it is that the Lord is doing for us out of our experience, then it can change. Then it can start to change. He does have no, he has no interest in it lingering. Now, okay, you just, you just feel that real nice and good. No. He remained connected. And then he showed his love for his neighbor. And that showed itself in, in so many different ways. He prayed for those who were his tormentors and prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. One day, as if to say one day when they realize what they're doing, they're going to feel terrible. Forgive them. Let them know when that moment of recognition comes of what they did and they feel absolutely their world has ended. Let them know that I already died for the forgiveness of what they're doing. At that very moment of absolute desperation that they will experience, that they immediately will know, but I died for you. So, now let's get to work. Forgive them, Father. And then the Lord Jesus saying to his mother and John, his disciple, there was a small group at the cross. Can, can, can you picture that? This is not a very good comparison. So I, But it would be as if you hold a small group, you're holding a service, you make a visit, and one person shows up. Two people show up. Okay, not exactly what I expected, but that's okay. Where two or three are gathered, we're good. So you're one, I'm one, we're good. But it doesn't, it it's, it's feels bad. You wish it was more than two or three. A very, very small group at the cross. Very small group. And most of his disciples, according to scripture, they were not there. The 12 apostles who he was gonna, he was gonna build his work on, the, the majority of them were not there. But he focused on who was there. John was there and his mother was there. That's another wonderful behavior, my dear brothers and sisters. Let us not get too distracted by what's not happening or by who's not here. Let's focus on what is happening. Let's focus on the moment that we are experiencing. Let's focus on the one who is in our life and see how can we, we are called to take care of each other. So John, take care. Here is your mother. And mother, here is your son. So now the church of Jesus Christ is almost officially begun with that statement. 
John, here's your mother. Mother, here's your son. The beginning of the church of Christ. Take care of each other. Take my word. Take the strength of my sacrifice. And I have already prayed for all of those who will come through you. And finally, the fifth behavior. He remained confident. And how do we know that he remained confident? Because of one reason in particular, because he said to the malefactor on the one side, today yet you will be with me in paradise. He knew, he knew. He was confident. That, that promise of however he knew that that's what happens next, but because of his nearness to his father, he knew that. He was confident, as awful as this moment is, today yet you will be with me in paradise. My dear brothers and sisters, that also contributes greatly to our calmness and to stay in control of ourselves in our behaviors because God has made promises to you. He's made promises to me. He's made promises to us amongst many promises. And I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. And so we know that. We know that. We don't know if it's today yet. We don't know if it's tomorrow. We don't know the when. Jesus knew it was going to be today. But we know that. Because we believe God, we believe his promises. And we hold on to them. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, calmness, prayerful, staying connected, sometimes experiencing what it feels like not being connected. So we know how much we don't, we do want to be connected and how it feels in a little way for those who have never experienced that kind of nearness and fellowship with the Lord. Confident, all these promises, God fulfills his promises and therefore he will come again and he will take those who have practiced his behaviors and practice that which he has taught, and he will take them unto himself, that where he is, they can be also, not because they were able to do it perfectly, but because they practiced, if I can say it that way, they, they became perfect in practicing. The outcome, we don't know, but they remained perfect in practicing my word and my behaviors and my grace, my victory I share with you. And so I died for you so that you also, what you have done will be counted perfect in the eyes of the Father because I'm giving you the peace that you cannot do. And then to love each other, take care of each other, pray for those who are troubling in our lives or the situations that are troubling in our lives. And then when we partake of Holy Communion this evening, my dear brothers and sisters, then this, this is what happens. The activity of the Holy Spirit makes bread and wine today as effective and powerful as it was when the Lord Jesus instituted it and said to his disciples, take this bread this is the strength to live your life as a Christian. This is my body. This is, my, this, this is what I did in my body. It's another aspect of Holy Communion. Take, this is the strength to live a life as my disciple. And here, this is wine. This is my blood. That you have the strength to give the sacrifices that you will be asked to make. God is not going to ask you to give your life as he, did, as he does me. But whatever those sacrifices are, here's the strength to live your life as my disciple. Here's the strength to be able to make the sacrifices that come along with being my disciple. Here, this is given for you. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, I think what has just happened is that we have received the word, 
we have received the preparation already for participating in Holy Communion. And now we'll listen to a, a hymn before we pray the Lord's Prayer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I proclaim unto you the glad tidings. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, your sins are forgiven, and the peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to this table. It is no longer what it was in the Old Testament, sometimes experienced as the Passover table, where there was wine, where there was bread, and there was actually a sacrifice, a lamb, literally speaking, that was sacrificed and now to be partaken of. And in that context then, when the Lord Jesus instituted Holy Communion, there was bread and there was wine on the table. There was no lamb on the table because he was the lamb sitting at the table. And so we come to that table. We come to the table where indeed it is the table of Jesus Christ. This is his table. This is his sacrifice. This is his life given for us. And dear Father, we are desirous of that life, that abundant life in fellowship, in joy, in the security of the peace of the risen one. May we all, each one, receive this special encounter now through the sacrament we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> And now we will celebrate Holy Communion. And now the Lord's table is prepared. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay there upon the once brought, eternally valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, gave thanks, and said, 
This is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, given for many for the remission of sins. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Amen. The body and blood of Jesus given for you. Amen. The congregation may be seated. And the Lord now invites you to Holy Communion.
Let us give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for drawing us so close to you in your word and sacrament. It is the place we love so well, and it is the place that we can't experience in quite any other way. Of course, we remain in our behaviors as, as close in alignment as we possibly can in between encounters like this with you at the altar. But dear Father, thank you for these moments that uplift us. They truly are like a spiritual thermal that we ride up in our heart. And indeed, they may not be visible to anyone else, but may they feel something. Dear Father, just as Matthew must have felt something to write what he wrote, even though it wasn't obvious yet to him as a human being, but he knew he felt it. Dear Heavenly Father, as we go upon our ways, may it also be something that is experienced and felt in, with all of those whom we have company with in our family, in our, in our faith, in our life, and with those whom you place in our life, our neighbors and all, dear Father. Those who are close to you and recognize that you are wanting to draw them close and those who yet really are completely undecided or maybe have even think that they have decided not to draw close in this way. But dear Father, you, you are the all-powerful and the all-knowing and the all-omniscient one. You know everything. We lay ourselves and we lay our prayers into your hand. And we know, as we are learning in this year, that indeed, when we ask for what you want to give us, then we receive the answers to our prayers. And one of those prayers is the Lord's Prayer, everything that we have prayed for together in the Lord's Prayer, that is what you want to give us. And we, we therefore try to connect our prayers to that prayer. And what we will hear now also in the benediction, that is what you want to give us. And so we are thankful and prayerful for this benediction. It is the grace and love and the, the communion that of the Holy Spirit that you want to give us, and that's what we are wanting of as well. Please bless our efforts, our offerings. Dear Father, we do so gladly. We only wish that we could do more, but dear Father, that is also something that we take out of your hand. You ask us to do the best we can with what we have in the moment, and this we will continue to try to do, each one of us. And we are especially thankful for the miracles that you have done, even in the ranks here of the congregation in the past days and weeks. Whether it is the miracle of recovery or whether it is the miracle of being able to carry grief where the miracle we had wished for or hoped for didn't develop, but now we experience the miracle of the power of your help to be able to fulfill your will. That is a miracle, dear Father. And so may we continue to walk in these miracles. Where it is possible, we pray that you can restore and provide also in our natural life. But most of all, dear Father, keep us strong in our faith and in our spiritual fellowship together. Now accompany us, we pray, with your angel service upon our way. And bless our steps as we walk towards our glorious Easter morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And my Lord.